right, let's go. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to day two of the Happy Home Summit. Uh, I've got uh, Dr. Cam McDonald here, who is the CEO of PH360 here in Australia. And Cam is just one of many of the experts that have come together within this summit to really support you and your family during the current climate and the crisis that you and we all are facing, all of the challenges that you're facing. So Cam comes with such an incredible background in what he does and what he gets to do in this world. And I really feel like it's needed right now more than ever. So Cam, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us all. Yeah, great to be here, Jess. Thanks for having me along. It's always a pleasure to talk about this stuff. Yeah. So for those people who don't, don't know you, um, can you just share a bit about you and what you get to do in this world through your work? Okay. Uh, so I am professionally a dietitian and exercise physiologist and uh, did my PhD at UQ. Long story short, saw a whole lot of people go through my intervention and realized that only some of them got benefit mm. and was wondering why. And it turns out that everyone's different and everyone actually needed something different than what I was providing in my intervention, which I thought was the best thing ever, which was in breast cancer survivors and uh, omega-3 and exercise. So something that everyone would think would everyone would benefit from, not everyone does. And so um, uh, I kept going forward and trying to find out why people wouldn't change or why they would and there was a whole lot of brain stuff that went into that. So I got really interested in the brain and that people needed a quick fix. And what I realized is that health needs to be without thinking and it needs to be really easy and really obvious. So, so obvious that it makes absolutely no sense at all not to do it. Um, but we're not there yet. We have not created a culture there that, that has done that, but we're definitely working on that. So along my journey, I, I found PA360 right at the beginning before it was even in beta phase, was in alpha phase. And I was lucky enough to be the first practitioner to uh, see. So PA360 is the world's most advanced platform of epigenetics. It understands what your body is, what it needs, and then delivers you information on what it needs in real time so that you can be in your best health across the whole number of domains, which I'm sure we'll talk about today. Yeah. Um, and so I got to use that with no prior knowledge. It conflicted a whole lot of stuff that I'd learned previously because it really looked at each individual, not generic research. And now, you know, my job, uh, I don't see clients anymore, but rather I support health professionals around the world, corporate organizations, uh, do a lot of speaking. And essentially just my, my job is to communicate information in a way that it can increase people's awareness so that they can take action in a way that's just going to bring about their best health. And so um, everything that I do is about helping raising awareness around personalization, knowing that people are different, helping people find peace within that and actually thrive from it as well. So mm. lots of fun stuff and I yeah. absolutely love it all. So, and it's, uh, it's been great connecting with you, Jess, in, all, along that journey and it's many more good things to come. Yeah, so awesome. And that's why I really wanted to have you on here, Cam, because I was lucky enough to do my training with you and I, you know, the epigenetic testing and profiling is really a core foundation of my work when I'm working with clients and parents and families. So I think this is just a brilliant opportunity for everybody to understand why it is so important for us to understand those biological drivers. Mm -hmm. So I guess one of the main questions that I, that I get is what, I mean, how do we determine those drivers based on biology? So in those beginning phases and those, that really foundational aspect of this framework, how would you answer that question? How does it work, Cam? Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's complex, but I'll make yeah. it simple. So yeah. let's say that you're looking at a body. Uh, you're looking at a body that's shorter, muscular, lean, like that kind of typical short athletic look. Um, in order for a body to get to that size and shape, it needs certain hormones and it needs certain genes to drive those hormones as well. Mm -hmm. And so if you have someone like that and then next to someone who's a sumo wrestler, that person, the first person we're talking about is never going to be the height and the breadth and the thickness of that sumo wrestler. And why is that difference? Well, the difference is because they have different genes and they have different hormones and from embryological time, uh, they actually developed differently in the womb as well. And without going into too much detail, uh, depending on which part of the embryo uh, has receives more energy in development, it will um, 
grow or give more emphasis to certain organs. And so that then uh, drives a different hormonal level, so much so that you end up with someone who's higher in testosterone and adrenaline and they're shorter, muscly, they're fiery, they love getting up first thing in the morning, all of that sort of stuff. But the, uh, it's, they have a dominance of testosterone. If you were to look at their blood markers or look at their, how they use testosterone, they actually use it differently to the person who's really big. That person who's really big has a completely different set of dominances in their hormones. They're more dominant in prolactin and growth hormone and IGF-1 because the only way you can become a sumo wrestler size is to have all of those hormones. And so the body shape that you have is a direct result of your hormones. Now you might say, well, I'm a different shape to what I was 20 years ago. And absolutely, but your bone structure is actually still very similar. It doesn't change much at all. Mm -hmm. And so your bone structure is where we understand this. This is where we can take a look at the skeleton and reverse engineer what happened embryologically. And from the bones that we have, uh, we can actually understand those hormones that have been most dominant. Now, if you've got testosterone that's more dominant, it makes shorter femurs. If you have more testosterone and more sex hormones like that, uh, you have shorter femurs. Uh, we also know that you're going to have a broader uh, trunk relatively and a, and a, a longer trunk. Mm. Um, and we also know you're going to have a square or a jaw for the most part too. All of these things are actually related to higher levels of testosterone and sex hormone binding globulin. And so not only does it change the shape of your body, but if you inject someone with testosterone, they get really competitive and really aggressive. And what we know about people with slightly higher levels of testosterone, not only does it change their shape, but it also changes the way their brain processes information that it receives. They're much more likely to be competitive. We, they're much more likely to be action oriented. We know they're more likely to step into more challenging behavior just because naturally they feel okay in that space because they have more testosterone. Mm. So as they develop, they go, right, my body's high in testosterone. So I need to make sure that I, I'm doing activities that also stimulate testosterone. Otherwise I'm not going to feel normal. Mm. And so we now have this body that is shorter, that is muscular, that is leaner because the testosterone helps you maintain lower body fat percentage. Um, it also makes you more inclined to move. Um, mm -hmm. it, it also makes you more competitive. And so this person's going to want to find lots of competition, lots of challenge, lots of change, anything where it can win and compete. Behaviorally, it's going to be driven that way. Mm -hmm. And it's got this body to match as well versus the, the sumo wrestler, the prolactin and the IGF-1 and the growth hormone all of those hormones, they make a bigger body, but what they do to the brain, if you insert lots of prolactin into a, someone's brain, it's called uh, breastfeeding, prolactation, it makes you incredibly selfless. And we have men and women that have higher prolactin levels. They have these bigger bodies and they are also the most caring and the most nurturing and the most outwardly focused when it comes to looking after people. And so that's just two examples. Obviously, there's, well, there's six major examples that we could talk about, but those two, essentially, how you develop in the embryo determines uh, which, which organs and which hormones are going to be most dominant. Those hormones and organs essentially contribute to how your body develops, which changes your size and shape as you grow. And that, those sizes are kind of locked in at three years old. So it's really early and it doesn't matter so much what happens later on in life. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so the, the skeleton is like the blueprint of your development. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that understanding, we can then reverse engineer and say, well, which hormones are involved in the skeleton? It turns out these hormones are involved in these, this skeleton. And so these hormones are going to influence the brain. What do we know about neuropsychology and testosterone? Well, we know they're more competitive. And so there's this beautiful flow from embryology uh, that helps us understand that, um, you know, obviously we can learn different behaviors, but we'll have this internal drive that, until we satisfy it, we won't be satisfied from a health point of view. You might say, no, 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 I'm not competitive and I'm not challenging and I don't like doing that. But your biology is saying that you should, um, or at least that you're tending towards that way. It's actually going to feel, life's going to feel harder because you're working against your natural genius. It's actually a great thing to be competitive. It's a great thing to be nurturing. There's no good or bad in this. It's just what is. And so um, that's, yeah. a, that's a basic foundation of what we're talking about. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And I guess one of the other things that keeps popping up for people that I speak to and work with is this whole nature versus nurture thing that seems to be a real, people have pretty firm views when it comes to that stuff, I find. So how, 
I guess, how does that work in terms of biology? And then obviously we've got our lived experiences after we come out of the womb and how does that influence our biological blueprint? Yeah. So, well, the blueprint never changes. It just makes the, it's um, essentially, let's say that for any given stimulus, uh, let's say you throw uh, fuel on a fire. What does the fire do? It gets hot, right? Yeah. And we would expect that because the fire has characteristics of heat. Mm. Whereas if we throw fuel on an ocean, mm. what happens? Nothing. Mm. It's like everything stays liquid and cool. And so this is exactly the same thing as our constitution, which is what we're talking about here. We're talking about a Western medicine validated constitution. Um, so if you've got this fiery temperament, which comes along with the shorter femurs and the higher testosterone and the, and the longer trunk and the squarer jaw, they're actually, they're more likely to be more competitive. And so you put them into any environment and it will play out that way. They'll be more expressive. They'll have to, they'll have to do something to dispel that energy. Mm. And so if they get taught as a child, no, you aren't to express yourself. You aren't to allow this. And we've, we've had, you know, Germany is a very rule following society. And we've got a few of these rule breakers, these uh, testosterone junkies that have come out. We call them activators yeah. who have come out after living their life in Germany, being told to do this, do yeah. this, do this, and actually for the first time in their life, express themselves as they want to, because rule followers don't need to express themselves because they process everything internally. And just you and I are one of those, we're crusaders and we, we process everything internally. Yeah. And so, whereas the activator needs to express things. And so if that, that gets suppressed, then it's like bottling up a fire either it's going to implode or it's going to explode. And she was imploding until we allowed her to explode. And once she started exploding, her whole life shifted. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what this is saying is that during your learning, if you have an awareness of yourself, you'll be able to put that learning into a functional place for yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you aren't aware of yourself and you're being told to act a certain way, and it's not congruent with what your biology asks you to do and what's, what makes your body feel best, then it will create disease. This is what disease is. It's misalignment with your biology. Mm. We sit down for 20 weeks and we misalign with our requirement to move. And so we get really good at storing weight because, you know, and, and ultimately disease comes from that too. Yeah. Uh, so um, that, that's probably the simplest way to explain it. What, what the health types give is a predictability as to how a body will disease if they're forced into a routine and rhythm that isn't theirs. But at the same time, if you have awareness of your health type, an awareness of your biology, then someone goes, oh, like rule, 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 rule. They can go, those rules don't suit me. I've got to express myself. They can communicate that way. Or they can say, uh, I can see what they're trying to do because rules are really important to them, but they're not really important to me. I'm going to make sure I go and express myself in a convenient way elsewhere. Sure. Uh, so they can still have their rules and I don't have to participate in it, but I don't bottle it up. And so what this does, essentially it cuts through 40 years of personal development and just yeah. says, just do this first, understand yourself, understand what your biology is driving you to do, and then go out and experience the world. And you find that uh, your ability to align with the things that make you feel great is just profound. Yeah, perfect. That's just the best, that's the best explanation of that. Thank you. And I guess I would love to go through just a summary of each of the six blueprints, just mm -hmm. so people have a bit of an understanding of where they may sit. Um, and then we'll go into the importance of, under, well, of being able to understand other people from that perspective. But so can we just go through each of them? Um, and yeah, you give a brief summary on them. Sure. I'll do, do um, like a little, what makes people feel safe. Uh, and that'll, that'll kind of describe it, I think, pretty well for the purpose of this. So uh, the first one that we've got is the ballet dancer, the super lean, very slender, very light skeleton. Mm. Um, this body is, has got a very dominant nervous system. And so they're thinking all of the time. That's how they protect themselves. They don't have the physicality to protect themselves. They need to be thinking all of the time to protect themselves because they can analyze everything that's going on. And so safety for them is certainty in the future and a list of jobs to do. So if they know exactly what they've got to do and they know exactly why they've got to do it, they'll feel really safe because they have the knowledge. They are constantly on alert all of the time and wired. Uh, you might say they're anxious, but they're actually just hyper aware of everything that's going on. Uh, with that hyper awareness, they are able to just take in a whole lot more information. The more information they have, the safer they feel. 
and they'll need things to be ex exactly exact. So, oh, what is my job? This, 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 this. And they'll love their lists and they like things to be put away and labeled correctly because that creates, creates certainty and no risk, no risk to the physical. So everything is about, I've got to analyze the world so that I can have enough information so that I can be safe. I like spending time by myself. I like things to be quiet. I like things to be ordered. Um, and I really like following the rules because that's creates certainty for me. So that's the, the ballet dancer. And you could see why that would be a perfect ballet dancer is like exact positioning, following the rules, a real taskmaster, like, and everything, and, you know, and then very solitude practice as well. Very mind body connected type movement. So that's the sensor. Yeah. We then have the opposite end of that, which is the connector. Mm -hmm. The connector is oxytocin dominant. And so what this means is that their number one goal in life is to connect and uplift everyone around them. You think of them like the sun. They respond really well to the sun. And uh, they, they also, uh, they're just happy for everyone. We call them the puppy dog. Um, and this is because they will be happy to play with anyone for any length of time, just as long as someone's there to engage with them and connect with them, they are happy. Um, what, they are, what their safety is searching for is trust and loyalty. Um, and they get that through very deep relationships. Um, the interesting thing though about oxytocin is that if they're betrayed or their trust is broken, um, what happens is that they, when they go to create trust again, uh, the oxytocin burst reminds them that you got hurt last time and they tend to then become more shallow. And so a, a connector in stress will actually have lots of interactions that are really shallow, but when, they, when they're able to become more vulnerable, be more transparent and really, because they'll want to be transparent, but, but really share what's in their darkest places with a very trusted person and have that connection, they'll feel incredibly safe. And so their number one job is to understand that their mind is going to be riddled with emotion and they need to verbalize it and get it out. This is a, a stature that's kind of barrel chested. Um, they've got uh, slender to, to medium sized legs. They've got good round musculature, really athletic square jaws, thicker than the, uh, the body that we were talking about before. Um, but the, uh, essentially their, their real thing is just about like, let's just connect, let's just have people around and everything's going to be fantastic. So, um, that's, so the sensor and the, the connector at opposite ends of the circle and the sensor is obviously an introvert connectors are an ultimate extrovert. And what I mean by extrovert is not like cam Oh, cam seems pretty extroverted cause he's out there and he's talking about this stuff and he seems really loud and not really let Jess say anything. Uh, that is not true extroversion. Extroversion is when you have an EEG machine on someone's brain and someone walks into the room and that EEG machine that was quiet is now a light with activity. That's extroversion. I get my energy from outside, not I can project lots out. Yeah. So uh, introversion is I get my energy from internal rest. And just before this, I was literally lying on the couch trying to get as much rest as possible because I've had a massive week yeah. because I get my energy back internally whereas my son he's a connector he needs uh he needs connection to feel energized and we went down to the park and um like we were playing the the, the dis social distancing rule, rules essentially which aches him more than anyone because all he wants to do is connect and he was just running next to this boy all around the park because he hadn't had a friend in the last week because he's been sure. inside yeah uh, it was like the, the best christmas ever and so they get energy. They are provided with more energy the more they interact. Whereas uh, the, the introvert, the sensor needs that quiet time to actually switch off. Yeah. And so we then have the activator. The activator is the, the first person that we spoke about today, the higher testosterone, higher adrenaline. And when you're searching for adrenaline and testosterone, you're searching for risk. You're searching for variety. You're searching for change. And so they don't feel safe unless they're doing something exciting um, or varied or different or competitive because that's what makes their body feel great. Mm. And so um, the thing that they're going to be searching for is uh, something to win at, something to focus on and really go after. And that'll make them feel really good. The, the thing about adrenaline though, is it can make you say yes to everything. And so they have this tendency of saying, Oh yeah, I'll do that. Oh yeah, I'll do that. Oh yeah, I'll do that. And because in the moment the adrenaline says, yeah, we can do this for sure. And they don't give a, a thought to the consequence coming forward. They just think about, I could spend all this energy now and it would be fine. And so uh, they can have this tendency to burn out because they are just saying yes to everything and they go a million miles an hour when they go, but they're only good for short bursts. They're the ultimate interval trainer, mm -hmm. high energy out, the highest out 
and then they need to go in. High sense. So these are the ambiverts. These are the ones that flip between extrovert and introvert because they get their energy from doing stuff and they also recharge when they're by themselves and lying down flat on their back. So yeah. there's this body, short, athletic, uh, you know, they're the energizer bunny type person that's just up first thing in the morning and say, oh, let's take on the world. Let's do this. This will be awesome. So uh, that's the activator chasing the adrenaline and testosterone. And then we have the diplomat, which is chasing the serotonin. Serotonin is really the opposite to uh, adrenaline and, and testosterone. Essentially serotonin or the search for serotonin is I want to search for um, satisfaction and calm. So when you start exercising, your serotonin levels increase the longer you exercise. And that makes you feel calm after you've done it. Cause you go, that was a good decision. I made a good decision for my family. I now have enough food. This is great. I feel good. Um, and so the serotonin pours through your system. It helps you calm and helps you feel relaxed. And the diplomat is actually searching for that all of the time. Now, adrenaline and testosterone, if you're in a constant state of, ooh, what's going to happen next? There's no guarantee that you're going to get your serotonin. There's no guarantee you're going to make a good decision when you're making lots of change. Mm. Whereas if you take your time with decisions, uh, and really consider things well, then there's a much better chance you'll get your serotonin. And that's exactly what diplomats do. They take time to consider. They've got bigger, stronger bodies. They're normally longer, um, but they're not necessarily longer. They can be short as well. They've got the most varied body. They can vary from the rock through to Nicole Kidman, you know, that kind of variation. And so irrespective, um, they've got this, uh, this calmer nature and they're searching for this cruising rhythm where there's no chaos because when there's no chaos, there's lots of serotonin. Mm. Where there's lots of adrenaline and testosterone, there's less serotonin. And so they're searching for uh, like they're the type of person that, you know, they've got this perfect night planned of I'm going to do this with my food and then I'm going to rest at night. I'm going to have a nice quiet, you know, watch three episodes of whatever it is on Netflix that I'm binging on right now. Uh, and then the activator partner comes in and he goes, Oh my God, I just met these new friends. And we've got to go out for dinner with them in 10 minutes. Like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. and if an activator was on the receiving end of that, they go, oh, that sounds like the best idea ever. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, the diplomat's going to go, no, like I've planned this whole night. Or they'll go, oh, like, you know, get, and get really anxious because now it's like, yeah. well, I'm not guaranteed that I'm going to get my serotonin. And so mm -hmm. uh, they're seeking the serotonin, seeking calm, and therefore look to avoid chaos and really like things to be measured. Yeah. Then the, finally, we have the, the crusader. The crusader is dopamine dominant. Dopamine is all about, I must achieve. Um, the, and essentially dopamine is not about achieving itself. It's about providing energy towards achievement. So it's, I'm on this ultra marathon run. When I finally finish the marathon run, I get my serotonin. But the thing that got me through the hundred kilometers was my dopamine. My dopamine is saying, this is important enough. I'm going to commit energy to it. Yeah. Everything else can go away. You muscle, we don't need you. You fat stores, we don't need you. We're going to throw everything at this ultra marathon and we're going to make sure we finish because it's all about the status. And so the crusader is this type of person that will wake up early, exercise, work all day long, work all night. And then they'll get to the weekend. I'll go, Oh, what jobs can I do? And I'll work all day. And they'll, and as a result, dopamine can make you very single minded. And often you can forget about the other people in your life when you're in a dopamine state. Mm. Um, so it's a very selfish hormone. It's not good or bad. It's just the way things are built. And so this individual, um, normally they're, they're kind of triathlete in their physical stature or Tour de France, uh, you know, that not as skinny as a ballet dancer, but they've got a little bit more muscle tissue, but they don't have as much as those CrossFitters. Yeah. So uh, they're long and slender. Um, and uh, they're built for endurance and that's the way their brain is built as well. Hyper skeptical of everything. They're constantly checking the facts. Like as they're listening to this, they'll be going, right, does Cam have enough credibility? Uh, has he said anything that I don't agree with yet? Has he used some grammar that I'm not happy with? Like they'll, they'll be picking the holes in everything that I say because they'll be, if they don't agree or they haven't heard of the, the principles we're talking about today, they'll immediately be skeptical and that's a perfect response for them. So if you're one of those individuals, I'm one of you too, and I totally get it. <laughs> so um, we then we, have, you. we yeah. have the guardian. The guardian is the opposite to that. So the guardian has uh, an abundant amount of prolactin. This is the sumo wrestler that we were talking about. And so prolactin is the opposite to dopamine. Prolactin is about everybody else's goals. Dopamine is about your goals. And so their focus when they're stressed is about, um, I need to protect and look after my flock. And if I'm not stable at home right now, 
then you know I'm I'm going to commit lots of energy to make sure that I can make home stable. I'll work tirelessly, and I've got a guardian client who looks after three kids, does all of the housework, has three jobs, has been tirelessly working for ten years. Her weight hasn't changed at all. She looks immaculate, um, but she's you know constantly trying to drop a little bit of weight. But her body during stress, which is what she's under most of the time it looks to conserve energy and that conservation of energy allows her to survive and look after people. Whereas the sensors and crusaders, these, the skinnier people, they actually use all of their own energy supply. Um, they use all of their energy supply when they're, when they're in some sort of stress. Um, and so they lose weight in a stress. Whereas the individuals, <laughs> whereas the individuals are, who are guardians with that prolactin focus, they will, um, they'll gain weight, they'll conserve weight because they're actually holding weight for everybody else. So that's the, the major six. And I guess um, there's a lot more, more, more depth we can go into that around body shape and all that sort of stuff. But that's a, a good start. Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> uh, it looks like one he, of those little hands. My, my little connector. Yeah, you can say, like, can, you Hello. Can just wave. Hello. All right, this is, <laughs> this is COVID life right now. Okay, bud, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. This is real. This is what it's like. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So brilliant. So the, we, you went into a lot of the behavioral stuff, which is perfect. And that's one of the main benefits of understanding biology. And then, so I guess, you know, people's minds are on how to keep healthy at the moment. So physically and nutritionally at the moment. So I guess, what are the health benefits of understanding your biology cam? How does Mm. that work? Yeah. So yeah, I did focus on the behavioral stuff because it's, it's easy for people to kind of relate to that. In Absolutely. The first instance. Perfect. To say that you need six meals a day. People go, Oh yeah, I guess. <laughs> so um, what we know is that different people need different foods. Uh, different people need different macros. They need different times of their meals throughout the day. They need different. And so a few examples that I'll give essentially yeah. people differ uh, by chronobiology, the time of the day and We've got the activator, the testosterone, adrenaline junkie. They get really hangry. Not only are they competitive and really fiery, they are really hangry. And they do really well having small snacks throughout the day and having their biggest meal at night, which sends them to sleep at night. They do their best exercise first thing in the morning and they're the perfect candidate for an early morning boot camp that's a little bit competitive, followed by eating and snacking all day, as most of the fitness industry would have you talk about. We then have the guardian which is completely different. The guardian, they've got this prolactin body. They conserve energy really well. And so they don't need lots of extra calories. In fact, they need far less protein than other people to build muscle because their hormones are designed to build. And so if they were put into the same, actually, I'll, I'll, so what they need is two meals per day, virtually no dinner, and they need to lift heavy weights in the afternoon or do very, very long enduring walking. Mm-hmm. So none of this high intensity boot camp stuff in the morning And what's really interesting is when we see a body like that do the high intensity stuff, it actually worsens their blood sugar levels. Mm. There's some really interesting data coming out now to say that if you are exercising in the morning intensely, um, essentially, uh, and you've got this body, this guardian body, it stresses your body so much because it's not set up hormonally for exercise at that time. And it makes the blood sugar levels worse for the rest of the day than if they did nothing. And so this is where high intensity exercise is not ideal for everyone at all times. In fact, if they're going to do it, they must do it in the afternoon because that's when it'll actually benefit them. Mm. And so, but then they'll do even better again if they do big volumes of walking and they do, they lift heavy weights and they eat two meals per day because if they eat six meals per day, and there's some, some really interesting studies around this, that if you have a person like that and they're eating six meals per day, and then uh, you feed them two meals per day, even with exactly the same macronutrients, like they eat precisely the same food. They just split it up over two meals, not six. Their weight loss triples and their diabetes risk reduces by three times compared mm. to doing six meals a day of healthy food. Yeah, so uh, this is where understanding and just those two examples of one person eating six meals per day with the heaviest meal at night and this person eating two meals per day, very low protein, and, uh, and virtually no dinner and heavy weights in the afternoon. Mm. Uh, and if they switch, they will go into disease. This is the thing. Like they, they could actually run into a problem where their body is now in a worse state. And so it's not just a matter of when you eat, but also what you eat. And 
Um, this, the specifics of whether you need spinach three times a week or kale five times a week, it's impossible for a practitioner. I'm a dietitian with a PhD and I have no chance of calculating in the moment whether a person should have spinach based on uh, all of the genetics that they have running, what they're expressing currently, the current climate, how much sleep they had last night, the stress that they're under, the, what is showing up in their body from a stress point of view and thinking, oh, they need, you know, this much folate from these sources with this combination of nutrients. Like there's just no way that we can do that. And so the technology, which is essentially what, what you specialize in, in coaching with Jess is uh, helps you understand exactly what you need to do so that there is no guesswork. So many people fight for years mm. to get no result. You know, they're doing the early morning boot camps. They're, they're eating their five meals of paleo. They're doing their, um, you know, their meditation, but none of that stuff is actually appropriate for their biology. What they need is they need family time. They need two meals per day. They need heavyweights in the afternoon and they need to understand how strong they are and that their finances need to be secure. Like that's actually what creates health for that individual. And if you don't understand that biology, then you can't create that environment. And it takes too long, too long. In fact, people will never get there. Like there are very few people that have really nailed it through their own self discovery, but we aren't taught how to listen to our body. And so you need to have a good measurement of your biology to understand what it needs. And there are, there are 10,000 things that you need to consider, literally 10,000 things that you need to consider when you're considering, should I have beef at dinner? Um, that, that, and that is taken care of in a, in a very short period of time by understanding, uh, you know, in, in the way that we understand it through the PA360 platform. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. And with um, not only do we understand the health, aspects of our biology but there's also certain diseases that come with a certain biology blueprints as well right so diseases are more likely for one blueprint compared to the other as well and that's a really huge benefit of this work too yeah well if you know what you um your body wants to disease in uh then that really helps but the thing that i would say about this and this is probably a real area of interest for me is how we explain disease let's say you take that body that is all about protecting everybody in their, in their world, the guardian, and they're always about nurturing and making sure everyone is okay. The safety mechanism, the way that their body looks after themselves in stress is to gain weight. Cause if I've got enough weight, I'm now heavy enough that I can last through the famine and still support my family while I've got that. It's this beautiful biological mechanism that protects the community. Now it's not great because we've got seven 11 open all of the time, and we have access to everything and we're never short of food. And so these genes are abused essentially by the extra consumption that's available to them. Mm -hmm. However, diabetes is just the ultimate survival strategy for this body. So they tend towards diabetes. I tend towards uh, c conditions that allow me to accumulate more mass. And so uh, diabetes is the perfect example of that. I'm going to be so good that every bit of carbohydrate that touches my lips, I'm going to turn into fat tissue, which is essentially what diabetes helps you do, that insulin resistance, which yeah. is the ultimate survival strategy for this body. Mm. It's The body is saying, oh, hey, I'm looking after you here, man. Like You've just got to stop being in such a stressed environment. We take that stress away and the body can normalize. Mm. And so whereas if we have diabetes in a, uh, a sensor, for example, um, it's actually not the same disease. In fact, it's uh, to do with, uh, inflammation of the pancreas as opposed to insulin resistance at the cells. And so the, what we do for that sensor is we calm their nervous system down. We take, we put the right foods in, we warm them up. We make sure their immune system is working correctly. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't just uh, take food away from them at nighttime and make them do heavy weights in the afternoon. We make them do yoga and deep breathing and that reduction in new nervous energy will calm them down so that they can and that will then normalize the inflammation and stop the diabetes whereas you know that body that the, the, the leaner bodies the crusaders and sensors are more likely to neurally degenerate because that's their nervous system that's on most of the time versus we see a lot more joint pain we see a lot more hypertension and heart disease in the activators and the connectors um, and we see as a primary disease and then we see a lot of asthma uh, we see more breast cancer in the diplomats. Uh, we see there's a number of cancers that are associated with being taller and that, that's a taller population down there. So um, if you know what disease, um, well, in fact, if you know what the body needs, then you can normalize the body so it doesn't go into a survival strategy yeah. that allows cancers to grow and diabetes to accumulate. Yeah. Um, so, and this is where 
it's, it's less and less about the condition that someone has, but rather what is the condition of this body? Uh, what is the, what does this body need in order to, to get back to homeostasis? Cause it's from that place that we treat disease. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a small summary on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And I guess, you know, this, this summit really is for families and, um, and that dynamic within the home. So I guess for you, what have you seen that this work benefit? I mean, how does it benefit families? You know, there's so many different personalities in a family and, um, so many, it can be so many different blueprints and everything. So how does it benefit them? Why, why is that something to consider? Well, any, any successful family will tell you that the number one thing that keeps a family together is good communication yeah. um, and understanding. Uh, so, and that's exactly what this, this work gives us. Essentially, it says, uh, I'm an activator. The way I'm going to communicate is bluntly and I'm going to express myself. And the crusader, in this case, takes that really personally when the activator just speaks the way that they normally would. They just, they're blunt, they're sharp. They've got adrenaline fueling their expression and they just go, they're out with it, blah, blah, blah. And then the crusader goes, well, there must be some logic behind why they said that. So I'm going to have to investigate that a little bit further. But what the crusader needs to know is that that's not the case at all. It's just the activated community communicating the way they wanted to communicate. Mm -hmm. The crusader is having to process everything internally and it just sends them into this spin and then they try and get the logic out of the situation, but there was no logic because this was just a feeling that came out of their mouth. And yeah. so if you know that someone is going to be more expressive with their emotions and that they are ruled by their emotions, which somebody's biologically are, mm -hmm. then you can allow that stuff to just go by you and not take offense. You go, oh, cool. Like anything else that you want to say, like let's get it off your chest. Um, versus if you know that you're living with a crusader and the crusader is just tapping away at work and doesn't seem to be thinking about anybody else, you go, ah, oh, that crusader, that's actually their mission. They're searching for something to fulfill their dopamine. They need this to feel normal. Oh, okay. That makes so much more sense now. Okay. Well, the way that I might interact with them is to say, Hey, can I schedule 20 minutes to spend some quality time with you? And the crusader goes 20 minutes, quality time. It's in the diary. Let's do this. But if they just go up and say, Hey, can I interrupt? And it's like, you know, I'm trying to get work done here. And so yeah. the first thing that I would say is that awareness is the number one thing. And even if you just, just assume that no one thinks like you, you will have a better family experience because it'll make you ask the question of, uh, well, what are they thinking? So yeah. what are you thinking? And yeah. then listening with an open ear without judgment. Yeah. And it's amazing how uh, quickly things can be resolved if you take that stance. And so yeah. the way that pH works is it essentially informs you mm -hmm. like my connector who just came on the camera just then, I know that is it a betrayal of his soul not to be included and feel special. <laughs> and so for me to keep pushing him away as I was <laughs> is my crusader way. I've got to stay focused here and look responsible. But then my, this is what, this is actually what went through my brain. Yeah. He's a connector. He needs to feel special and he needs to feel included because that's what oxytocin is driving him to do. Mm. I want him to experience being himself and feeling safe to be himself. That's what I want for him. And so in order for me to ex execute on that, if I keep pushing him away, he's yeah. going to feel disconnected. Mm. So by bringing him in and knowing, hoping that everyone's going to be okay. And it now being an awesome teaching point yeah. um, by bringing him in, he gets to feel special he like rolls around on the bed over here and then he runs out and he's happy. Yeah. Um, I'm satisfying him. But the way that I do that is thinking, well, I can use this as a teaching point because crusader is like having a purpose for things. Um, I know that he needs this and I know that it's not going to damage this interview too much. So the risk stratification went through my brain yeah. and I went, all right, let's bring him on camera. Meantime, he's now feeling a whole lot better and I'm not, but if it had been me six years ago, yeah. Actually, if only a few years ago before I really kind of got this stuff, yeah. um, I would have said, I would have got angry. I would have said no, I would, and he would have felt really bad yeah. and, um, and it would have meant now a miscommunication. So what this does it, and this is what the parenting stuff is all about. It's like, if you understand your child's biology, it is the ultimate parenting book ever because every parenting book is about, Oh, what I did for my child and what I think works and let's all communicate the same way and be glorious and it doesn't work like that you know there's terrors at times and but there's a reason as to why they are terrors yes and the biology like they are the perfect living examples of how biology expresses itself because they have no prefrontal filter That's they right. just are biology 
And so I don't want to stifle my child from being himself. I want him to be comfortable in his biology because that creates health for him. Mm. And so uh, I need to be particularly, and I can still be so much better. Um, I can be, I have to be particularly more social and I really make sure that whenever I'm not working, I'm going out and connecting with him immediately and yeah. making sure that he knows that I'm there because that's what his body craves. And so yeah. that has created something for me because otherwise I would be so caught up in my own dream. And so the reason why I give my example was because it was relevant. But second, um, it, it, it's created an awareness for me to say, I know why he does things. I know what he needs to feel his best. And yeah. so um, uh, when I have that information, I'm so much better armed as a parent and stuff doesn't stress me as much now. Like it's, I just go... The reason why he's being an aggro little turd is because he's trying to connect with me. Ah, so I just connect with him and all of a sudden he turns into this brilliant little kid again. Whereas for me, I would need a rule. You say, you don't disturb daddy at this time. We don't talk like this at this time. We don't do this at this time. And I go, great rule, 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 rule. I can nail that. I can excel at that. So what I needed as a child, very different to what he needed as a child. And mm. fortunately I had a mum with the same health type and she was very real focused, which was good. Yeah lucky lucky right and that's it's so often i mean a lot of the parents that i'm working with it's always very interesting to see how you know each blueprint they communicate right if we get parents on the same level and then parents understanding their children then like you say we just have so much better communication we have a lot more understanding and that removes all that frustration yeah. so that's that's the real benefit there Absolutely. exactly it's, yeah. it's the foundation of no frustration. So you can have better communication through acceptance. Yeah. Like that's, it's, it's a supercharged way of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, and so I guess I always, I loved, um, you know, trying to understand this within children, you know, because we do have those dominant traits sometimes. And I know within our training um, when we did a while back that we, when we understand how it shows up in a child, then we can, as we've just said, we can understand children a whole lot more and, and how this can sometimes show up in the classroom and, and all of that and how children are being misunderstood and all of that. So can you just provide some examples of how it might look a little differently and what they actually might be communicating based on their biology? Because I just do think there's a lot of confusion um, in the population around behaviours with children, of course. Right. Are we talking about in the classroom now? Yeah. So just, just in general, just in general. So I think sure. it's brilliant that, um, you know, you understand that your sons and connector is, yeah. is perfect. And I just wonder if there's any other families that you work with or parents, even in terms of like husband and wife relationship, yeah. how understanding the other one totally transforms their relationship even, which ultimately impacts the whole family home. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, would probably the, it's a very broad question. So uh, yeah, yes. but it's cool. So, the, so I would say um, probably that the key message that I kind of got out of that was, um, or the, I, the came to my mind when you were talking about that was um, understanding a child is who they are and not, not they're constantly trying to meet this box of criteria that we have for them to meet. And yeah. so uh, some examples from, from my experience right here, and then I'll kind of launch into some school stuff is that, I've got a son who is hyperactive and he is constantly seeking attention and he's constantly breaking rules and you would definitely medicate him if you weren't aware that he is just searching for connection. And when we put him into a classroom, he's constantly searching for attention. And this is because when he gets attention, he gets connection and he feels normal now. Like he's happy to stand up in front of class and do funny things and, and gets really, he gets over energized when he gets that opportunity yeah. and I can look at him and go, Oh my God, that is my son being his brilliant self as opposed to my son is acting like a mad hatter. And instead of going off to a, a pediatrician or a child psychologist and a child psychiatrist and getting medication, I realize, Oh, what he needs is his safety, which is connection. Yeah. Yes. Whereas other kids, might be such brilliant academics, but they just want to spend all of their time in their room by themselves. And you think they're socially distant yeah. and they've got these problems because they aren't as social or they're not as outgoing, but they're completely introverted. And that is exactly how they're supposed to be. And their strength is in their internal thoughts mm -hmm. and really getting to really thoughtful outcomes. And so what I guess I'm saying here is that every single child, and I don't care where on the spectrum that they are, 
uh, for what for what you feel they may lack in one area of their body, they will have a superpower in another aspect of their body and yes. or on how their mind works as well. And I would say that the lens of that understanding is so essential because we go to schools and we have kids that sit at the back and they get a little bit bored because they've now been doing the same thing for 10 minutes. And so they start disturbing the whole class and they go, oh, this kid is a real breaker. But then they've got this cheekiness and this charm that they seem to get away with it. And the, the report cards come back like, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's a very <laughs> sharp, astute boy. It would just be great if he could focus a little bit more. But the thing is that I don't realize that this is a physical, a musculoskeletal dominant body that needs to move. And if they get out and move, run around the block 20 times, they come back and they'll be completely calm and they'll fly through their work because their brain is incredibly powerful. But yeah. because it's searching for variety and expression, they don't get that in a quiet classroom, but they do get it in a, um, in a, in a, ex, like an exertive exercise bout. And one of our, our parenting gurus, uh, Nikki, she, um, she was, uh, in a classroom. She's a, a teacher and she like, she set some stuff for the class to do. They already kind of knew what they had to do and she just let it go. And normally like she's a sensor. So she, she likes it being nice and quiet. And normally she goes around, she's she, like shushing everyone and all that sort of stuff. And she just, with this new lens, because it had been a while since she'd taken a class and she'd done all the PA360 training as you had um, before walking into the class. And so went in and just kind of let it happen. Like just said, we've got this work to do, let's go. And so what she found is that the sensors and the crusaders were up the front. They just asked questions until they had all of the information that they needed and they worked quietly by themselves. The activators and the connectors were constantly either moving around the class or sticking with the same group of friends and chatting the whole time but getting all of the work done that they needed to. And then the guardians and the diplomats are the more steady. They were there. They were just making sure, like actually making sure that everybody else had the answers and that everyone was okay. And she watched this play out. Everyone acted exactly the way that they needed to and exactly how in congruence with their biology. Mm. And they all got their work done, but did it in a way that where there was no stress because they weren't being boxed into, you must be quiet, which was perfect for the people up the front. Yeah. And so, I guess that the realization that's come out of this is that the kids like kids don't have a choice, but to follow their biology. And so if you are got a child that's playing up, there's a problem with the level of safety that they have around their biological needs. And some kids need instructions. That's why they're like asking more questions and being annoying. Some kids need family stability and connection. Other kids need variety, change and challenge. And just knowing that children need these different things, just like we said, if you just assume that every child is biologically searching for what is feels safe for them, every expression of who they are is trying to feel safe. And I would even say that that actually translates into adulthood as well, is that every single person in a relationship, they will act a certain way to protect themselves from something. It's just when we get, adults we get this prefrontal cortex and we second guess ourselves and so if we experience hurt we now do everything that we can even if it's dysfunctional to avoid that hurt again and so but our, our biology is still trying to protect itself just in a more advanced kind of setting and so when it comes to parents understanding each other like just you know having having an understanding of your partner at a biological level we have couples with 40 years of experience that have understood themselves as much as they think they can and have lifetime breakthroughs just by understanding the simplest bits of biology. And so yeah. there's so many ways this applies, but essentially it comes down to the bare essence of everyone's biology is trying to push to their expression. Yeah. That is what's happening. We can't stop it. No. And so if you like ride the wave, life will just become easy. If you fight it and if you're finding life hard, you are fighting against your biology and there's, there's no two ways about it. Yes. That's like the perfect that's the perfect ending summary main point. Absolutely. And I know that I found that when I found out what I was, all the things that I'd hated myself for years and years, well, ever since I can remember, I just dropped away just that beautiful acceptance of who I am and that understanding. And then now that I get to understand everybody else, relationships transform, my communication transforms. My work with families now is so much more impactful and powerful and transformative because parents now understand their children and they understand each other and that creates it creates patience understanding love connection 
and freedom, freedom of self-expression, which is absolutely core, especially for our children to grow up to be who they are meant to be. Um, so thank you so much. There has been such an incredible amount of information that you've shared, Cam. I really appreciate it. Um, and to, to finish us off, is there anything that you feel like is missing or that needs to be driven home or you feel like we've covered everything? I think it's pretty good, but I would, yeah. I would make a point on um, uh, just finally on the immunity side of things. Hey, bud, no silly stuff, please. Uh, you can wave, you can wave, say hi. Everyone, there's like 500 people that are watching you right now, bud. Okay. Say hello. So many. I'll be, I'll be done in five minutes, okay? They were watching you, bud. Okay. Five Pretty minutes, jumping. I promise. Um, so the, uh, the most important thing is with all of this is understanding, hey, bud, can you please? Or be out in five minutes, then we can play, okay? Um, the um, yeah. So the um, when when we get misaligned with our biology, it also depresses our immune system. And so right now, at this time, right now, um, even if we create a vaccine, there have been cases where people have got this virus multiple times because it changes. And so um, what we know is that. The, the, the strongest defense that you have against everything that's going on is a really strong immune system. Yeah. Um, and when your body is de-stressed, when your body is aligned with its biology, your immune system actually increases. And so every time you have a better interaction with a family member, every time that you have a slightly better meal, every time you do the right kind of exercise for you as well, and, I'm, and I just you help people with this really, really well, um, every time you do one of those things, you take some stress and you add some strength to your immune response. So when you take care of yourself in this biological way, you also get to really confront this problem right now. And not only does it support you with this thing right now, but it also supports you in the long term too. So mm. like the final thing is that it's, it's, I guess we've spoken about if you live, you know, for who you are and, and how your body wants to go, you'll find it easier. Um, generally what you do, but it's linked to every part of your health as well. This is reversing of disease. This is, you know, reaching your potential, um, whichever one that you want to do first, I would suggest you go through your potential and often disease will resolve itself. Um, but the, uh, this is something that, that leaks into every part of your life when you get it right. And so I would, I would strongly encourage people to truly investigate it and, and give it a good crack. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really important point right now. And, and afterwards as well, long-term, this is really important, especially when disease um, is so prominent. That's obviously a key aspect to what PH360 stands for is reducing that dramatically um, and improving relationships, which is really important. So um, the, only, the final question that I ask everybody, Cam, through this summit is for you personally, you know, within your family, what, what does a happy home feel like and look like to you? Ooh, okay. Uh, that's good. So for me, and this is, I guess the, 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 for me, it is, um, people understanding like each person in the house, understanding what each of those people is about and what they're trying to achieve mm. and, and supporting each other to do that. Um, that for me is the, is the biggest thing and doing it, doing it with an awareness where, uh, you don't take yourself too seriously and, um, and you can well, essentially you can laugh at yourself. So if, if those things are going on, like I guess that's a pretty crusader thing because I'm on a mission. But if um, everyone's got their own little purpose, and if we're supporting each other in creating that purpose, mm -hmm. um, I think, and and probably I, it sounds like a really strange thing to say, but essentially, um, allowing each person to live out their life to their maximum, whatever that might be, you know, in whatever capacity that might be. Um, and having an awareness to that, that we're all kind of separate entities that have decided to live together. You know, there's a lot of choice in the world and you can choose not to live with your family. You can. And so I would say that it's having respect for where each person is at and where they're going and, and supporting without ego. I think that's probably the biggest thing that I'd, I'd like in their house. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I think that's a really, that's a nice idea to me too. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much, Cam, for joining us. And if you have questions, you just need to pop it below. Um, and if you have questions about how this can help and relate to your family, then you just need to get in contact with me and I will certainly be in contact with you to provide any support or answers um, at the moment. So thank you, Cam. And uh, I hope you, yeah, 
I hope your family are doing well and you're doing well and yeah, really appreciate all the information today. You too, Jess. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.